today we will have uh, a little chat with the two main investigators of the Doremi study. It is a study comparing milrinone to dobutamine in cardiogenic shock. And these investigators are from Canada, um, Ottawa in particular, but other cities were involved. But we have here uh, Rebecca Mathieu, who is the first author, and Pietro Di Santo, who is the second author of that study that just appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. So Rebecca Pietro, hello, nice seeing you. Hello. And um, I will briefly remind uh, our audience that this was a, a study comparing milrinone to dobutamine in, uh, in patients with cardiogenic shock, well-defined uh, with uh, a median left ventricular ejection fraction of 25%, all had, or virtually all had an increased lactate level, mortality rate about 40%. There were several endpoints, a combined endpoints, and secondary endpoints. And to me, there is no difference. The outcomes are absolutely similar in the two groups. Did I miss something? Your turn to make a comment. Rebecca, do you agree? I, 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 completely, I completely agree. That's exactly how we interpret it as well. And Pietro, too? Yeah, exactly. I mean, certainly we didn't see any differences in the primary composite outcome um, and uh, important secondary outcomes. I think that the Cole's notes there is there is no difference between these two inotropes that we were able to detect. Yeah, I forgot to mention that there were about a little less than 100 patients in each group. So uh, it, it's a nice series. Uh, now, as, as an ICU doctor, I would like to ask you if you could find some differences in hemodynamics. You mentioned that there was no difference in heart rate between the two groups, right? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, in, in looking at the literature, when we were going into thinking about designing and planning and implementing this study, I think Pietro and I both felt that we probably would find a difference in heart rate. Um, you know, even going back to the late 1980s and the early 2000s um, with Moran's study um, and then the precedent study, we were expecting higher mean heart rates, higher amounts of ventricular arrhythmias with dibutamine. And I think even in terms of anecdotally, what our seniors um, uh, and mentors and supervisors uh, had always taught us is that we would expect a higher heart rate. So I think for both of us, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, although my reading of the literature may not be exactly the same, uh, it seems to me that it's primarily the increase in cyclic AMP, which is associated with a higher heart rate. So I would not have expected a major difference in heart rate. Pietro, what do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, I think certainly Rebecca and I have very similar training and, and as she alluded to that, uh, you know, we, our teaching has been that th there would be potentially a difference between the two, given that the beta receptor effects of, of the dobutamine um, compared to the phosphodiesterase uh, inhibition from milrinone, right? And um, the other thing too is, is that the data that Rebecca is referring to predominantly comes from uh, decompensated heart failure and whatnot. And is there a, a difference in terms of the sympathetic or adrenergic drive in critically ill cardiac patients with cardiogenic shock that perhaps is already maximally stimulating those beta receptors and, and therefore we're not actually seeing those changes in heart rate that we might have expected? Okay, interesting. What about the blood pressure? Because we know that may be known as an inodilating effect. The dilating properties may be stronger than with dobutamine. Any difference there? I think, you know, the, the, you know, again, to our surprise, we were expecting increased hypotension or episodes of hypotension, um, increase in vasopressor usage uh, in the patients treated with milrinone, as you have uh, suggested. And, you know, um, I think there might be some reasons for why we didn't see that. You know, in a lot of the other studies, uh, milrinone was given with a bolus. In our study, um, they were just initiated on the infusion. Um, which is a bit more reflective of practice. I think there might be reasons for why we weren't seeing that hypotension and perhaps that gradual accumulation of milrinone um, could have mitigated some of that hypotension that we would have expected. Very good, okay. Now, very shortly, uh, we have several phosphodiesterase inhibitors available. Uh, there is no reason to suspect that another molecule like enoximone would give other results, right? 
You agree? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So would you say that phosphodiesterase inhibitors are just out in the management of cardiogenic shock? Forget about them? Or would you say, well, there may be some patients who may perhaps still benefit from uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors? What do you think, Rebecca? So I personally don't think we should completely remove them from the equation. I think with the best available data that we have to date, we feel like there's equivalency between the two drugs, but this is where you need to marry the data that we have and the anecdotal experience that we have and make clinical decisions at the bedside where we're very cognizant of the bias that we have going in. Um, so to me, it doesn't really matter. I start looking at other things like half-life, potential cost of running the infusion when I make um, um, decisions, but there may be a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension, and I just feel like this is a patient that I want to try milrinone on as opposed to dibutamine. But I think as long as we're aware of what our bias is going into making these decisions, I do actually still think there's a role in certain subsets. But hmm. certainly, studies, you know, bigger studies, multi center studies um, are warranted to really explore pharmacologic management more in this subset of patients. Mm, yeah, we always need further studies, but uh, what about <laughs> levosimendan? Uh, uh, would you be ready to study it the, the next time or, or not? Pietro, what do you think? I think that's a great question. You know, the levosimendan is not readily available in North America, um, in contrast to our European colleagues uh, that use it uh, more frequently than we do. I think the interesting thing about levosimendan is when you've looked at meta-analyses, network meta-analyses, looking at the differences between inotropic therapy, there might be a signal towards uh, improved outcomes with levosimendin. I think a, an amazing study to do in the future would be comparing levosimendin to other inotropes. And, to, uh, to, to dibutamine, you mean? To, to dibutamine, sure, or, or milrinone, right? I mean, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, given that there's no difference between the two, I don't think that the comparator arm necessarily needs to be one or the other. Um, yeah, but... You know, I think... If you showed I, that, I was going to say that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was also going to add that you know, given that, um, given that we don't even know if inotropic therapy is even necessary yeah. in the sense that it, these have never been placebo-controlled trials, right? And a lot of the the feedback that we've been getting is, you know, what is the role of placebo-controlled studies in in cardiogenic shock? Well, if you are dealing with a patient who is not making urine, who is vasoconstricted, with altered mentation, I wouldn't leave the patient like that. I would do something. No, Rebecca, what do you think? You know, I think I think that's actually the next very fascinating question to ask. Um, it's not to say that you leave these patients for days and days without any additional support, but this is actually the next trial that we're running through ethics to get up and running, which is uh, sort of part two of, of Doremi, and that's actually to look at inotrope versus placebo in the initial resuscitation. So in those first 12 hours, those sky C, sky D patients that are coming in to really see if the benefit that we think is there with any inotrope, so for us, DOB or MIL, if there is actually a role for inotropic therapy. And, and as, um, as Pietro was alluding to, that's actually been one of the big questions that's come up over the last week um, from our colleagues and collaborators uh, everywhere. So I, I'm actually very excited and, and really looking forward to getting that trial up and running. I think that's going to be very interesting. In some institutions, I have seen some people giving the butamine in cardiogenic shock, but keeping a little bit of beta blocking agents there, uh, they argue that when you can stop the dobutamine administration, they're already on beta blockers. I have difficulties to accept that, but I would like to have your opinion. Do you think it makes sense to do that? I think that's a, that's a great question as well, actually. And um, we just published in uh, Critical Care, um, uh, released yesterday, was the um, subgroup analysis of patients that were treated with beta blockade in the preceding 24 hours prior to randomization. And in fact, we found no differences between patients that were on beta blockers uh, and not, and uh, additionally, irrespective of inotropic therapy. So even those patients that, you know, historically we've been taught that patients that have been on beta blockers may not respond to dobutamine given the mechanism of action, yeah. you know, but, uh, but we found no difference in terms of outcomes or hemodynamic parameters. Um, the interesting thing is that there was a signal um, and certainly we're not powered to look at this directly, but 
there was a signal and it's quite hypothesis generating that there was a reduction in ventricular arrhythmias and early death in those that had um, you know, been treated with beta blockers. And therefore, could there be a potential uh, therapeutic avenue here where that we could pursue in terms of arrhythmia uh, mitigation and, and management that could actually change the prognosis in cardiogenic shock? Interesting. Do, do you still keep epinephrine, adrenaline somewhere, Rebecca, or you never use it? Um, I, I mean, generally, I, I really sort of, um, I believe in the results of Optima CC. And in my mind, I've kind of taken epinephrine off, especially in, in terms of first line uh, vasopressor therapy. I lean a lot on Levofed, as do I, I think in, in our institution and, and definitely on our yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so epinephrine, I start thinking about as, you know, like my third line presser. Yeah, um, right. I think there is a role, um, but I think very cautiously. Um, so, yeah. Uh, we are reaching the end of our conversation, but you know, Rebecca, you are the first author of that paper. And it's wonderful to see that woman can achieve such a position and lead a, such a trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine as uh, it was written recently, less than one third of papers have a woman as a first author, especially in major journals. So did you find it a challenge? Is it a challenge for a lady like you to achieve this position? Um, you know, I feel I can only speak from personal experience, um, but I feel as though I was uh, I was able to attenuate a lot of those usual challenges um, by the mentorship that I had um, and the fact that I was involved very early on in my training in terms of hypothesis generation, design, implementation, enrollment, every step of, of putting this project together, because it started with a question on rounds uh, with our supervisor, Dr. Hibbert, and then kind of led to all of this. So I, I, I didn't have as many challenges as I know my female, my female colleagues have, have struggled with, in large part because of the mentorship that I had by our lab and our, and our group here in Ottawa. Um, you know, I, I certainly am not the first. Um, I, I no. certainly will not be the last. And I think, you know, the, the anecdotally, the number of women that are cross-training in cardiology and critical care is pretty amazing over the last five to 10 years in terms Isn't of- Isn't it I've even seen. more? in Canada than anywhere else. It seems to me that Canada is really a leading position in this, um, in this field, right? I, I think so. And I think across Canadian universities, people really uh, emphasize the importance of mentorship and how it comes in lots of different shapes and forms. Yeah. And your mentor may not look like you or be the same gender as you. Um, but, you know, the advice and the guidance and the safety net they provide to allow you to stumble and help you pick yourself back up in that process of doing something like this um, is really emphasized here. So, um, so I, very I feel good. very lucky. So Pietro, it's a matter of atmosphere and, and, and leader. The leader has a major influence, I suppose. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, um, we are very fortunate, as Rebecca has alluded to, that um, our, our group here in Ottawa is very well supported. And in fact, um, the majority of the authors on our New England paper were trainees. Um, and uh, right. I think that, that, that speaks uh, volumes to the to the um, uh, support that we have and the encouragement to pursue, uh, you know, academia and and uh, it's uh, you know a huge credit to uh, uh, Ben Hibbert who is the senior author on the paper regarding uh, all of his mentorship over over years. Excellent. Many thanks to both of you and congratulations. Please go on in the same direction. It was a pleasure. Take Thank care. You. Thank Bye -bye. you, Professor.